you do think about, is it selfish? Is it worth it? Is it something? So, um... Sir Richard Branson! Richard Branson is one of the most fun-loving and adventurous billionaires in the world. He's conquered our skies, blasted off into space. The entrepreneur's entrepreneur, the marketer's marketer. In the school of business, they said focus. By the age of 33, you've got 50 different companies. You kind of break that law, it seems. If we'd stayed still and only focused on one business, we wouldn't have a business today. We're still going strong 55 years later. If you get the little details right, makes for an exceptional company over an average company. We were the first airline to introduce seatback videos in the world. Sleeper seats for business class passengers. We've always been ahead of the pack. The airline's been bullied by British Airways, famously through the Dirty Tricks campaign. The best always succeeds as if all of that you'd done before wasn't enough. You decided to aim for the stars. We're going to space. Looking back at this beautiful, beautiful Earth that we live on <laughs> whilst floating, it was a dream come true. You know, we're still at the early stage of space travel, and there's still risks. One pilot has died after a passenger spaceship crashed. Everything that we'd built up uh, looked like it was crashing down. What impact does that have on you and your mission? got to continue. Before this episode starts, I have a small favour to ask from you. Two months ago, 74% of people that watch this channel didn't subscribe. We're now down to 69%. My goal is 50%. So if you've ever liked any of the videos we've posted, if you like this channel, can you do me a quick favour and hit the subscribe button? It helps this channel more than you know, and the bigger the channel gets, as you've seen, the bigger the guests get. Thank you and enjoy this episode. Richard, having spent the last 24 hours reading both your autobiographies, but also your new HBO um, docu-series, Eve, your mother, um, she, she felt like a really, really extraordinarily principled and um, strong character. And in the docu-series, you actually say that you didn't realise how much she had influenced you on becoming the entrepreneur you are today. What was it that she was doing, I, pushing you out of the car at four, five years old and making you walk home? But what, is, what was, were those principles that underlined her approach? So, I mean, she was one of the sort of uh, first entrepreneurs around, really. I mean, not, you know, not a particularly successful one, but she was um, making table mats and, you know, cutting out pretty pictures from books and, 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 and um, turning them, to, you know, turn, turning them into... Uh, pictures that she would then take to Harrods or um, Harvey Nichols. Um, interestingly, and I, I didn't realize this until I saw, saw it in some letters uh, that she'd written to me, um, uh, um, you know, working from a phone box in, in, in London. Um, and, um, uh, and that was her office, just like my office had been later on work, working from a phone box at school. Um, but... Um, uh, yeah, but so she she would never stop. She 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 was an idea idea a minute, um, always trying to um, uh, uh, you know better be, better our lives, uh, better, and um, um, and also always trying to create things that she could be proud of. When was, when was she most proud of you? In terms of what kind of behaviours or achievements would make her most happy when you were young? Um. <laughs> She, um, yeah, she was she was um, fairly, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. She she was she was fairly firm when it came to you know the need for um, you know being courteous um, from a young age. And I mean, I remember uh, uh, in church one day, I refused to go and sit next to. Some, somebody that she wanted me to sit next to who was maybe visiting our house. Um, and when I got home, um, uh, she asked my dad to spank me. And uh, that, that had never happened before. And my dad um, takes me into, into the living room, into, into the next door room and, um, uh, and um, instructs me to burst into tears. And he slaps his hands together very hard six times. <laughs> I come out rubbing my bum. Um, but, um, 
Um, and then, of course, she regretted having done it in the first place. But of course, it never happened. So, um, <laughs> they, um, but um, um, but that you know that, that you know she 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 you know she generally speaking, it was um, unreserved love. But she she wanted us to uh, care for other people properly. Um, you know, if we ever said ill about somebody, we'd be sent to the mirror and. Uh, we'd have to stand there for ten minutes uh, because it, it, you know, she felt it reflected so badly on us uh, that we'd said ill of somebody, um, and you know those sort of less lessons I think were very, very, very powerful and very good uh, later on in life when I was, you know, leading people, um, always trying to look for the best in in everybody. One of the threads throughout your story, which um shocked me, surprised me and inspired me in many ways throughout the docuseries was this continual desire to move on to the next thing and, and make things bigger and to capture another opportunity, which struck me as being at times like a really defining character of, of you. You know, even when things seemed to be successful by anyone's estimation, you pushed on again and then you'd push on again and again. Do you, do you have any idea where that instinct or that characteristic came from in you? I'm sure that came from um, uh, my mum. I am son of Eve, which which is my mum's name, um, and um, but it's all, also I think because I was dyslexic um, and you know pretty hopeless at school, um, I've forever been trying to prove something to myself um, and um, and 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 prove something that, you know when she was alive to her and my dad. Um, and um, uh, I'm inquisitive. I just love I love learning about new things. Um, uh, and once I've actually absorbed everything there is to know about, you know, the the, uh, the thing I've just created, I'm apt, apt to want to move on and learn learn something about something completely different. Um, particularly if I feel other people are not doing it well, and and um, so I just love. Diving in there and and um, uh, trying to you know shake up an industry that is badly run. Do you think she she and your father, even your father um, Ted, had high hopes for you? I think that um, my mum uh, definitely thought that I would be. Um, yeah, she 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 decided that I was going to be prime minister of uh, Britain one day and. Um, uh, and I think that, um, yeah, she, so she, she definitely had high hopes for me. Um, uh, my dad just wanted uh, us to be happy. I mean, he was um, a very uh, love, lovable, content, um, funny, uh, witty uh, individual. Um, wanted to be an archaeologist, but ended up uh, going into the law after, after the war. And would have been happy, I think, what, you know, as long as we were happy. Um, he, he didn't mind, you know, he didn't really want to push us. But, um, but my mum, I think, expected, expected more of us. You mentioned school um, a few moments ago. You and me both have a similarity in that we were hopeless in school. You went off to boarding school at seven years old, which in and of itself is a pretty extreme experience for a seven-year-old. You described this as being a little bit too young in your view. Um, and you struggled in part because of your dyslexia. At the time, did you did you know what dyslexia was or what it meant? No, I had no idea what dyslexia was. I just um, assumed that I must be a little bit thick. Um, I mean, I could just about add up and subtract, but when it got to more complicated stuff uh, like algebra and geometry and the likes, I couldn't understand the reason for it. I wasn't interested in, in it. You know, I couldn't understand why we were having to learn French when when um, nobody seemed to ever actually speak it when they left school, and um, or Latin, or um, and um, and so I suppose in my head I rebelled against um, being taught things that I couldn't see the relevance of, um, and um, and actually that was a good thing because it 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 ended with me rebelling from actually staying at school and leaving school at. 15 um, and uh, and creating some uh, 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 and creating a magazine uh, which um, uh, to try to sort of uh, address some of the issues in the world your dyslexia um, you've often highlighted that in many respects it's been a superpower 
It's given you skills that have led to your success. What, what, what is that? What are those skills and what is the advantage in your view of this dyslexia and how that's changed how you function and operate? Um, I think uh, that, um, well, first of all, I, I, I would like to say I'm proud of being a dyslexic thinker. Um, and I, I'm delighted that uh, dyslexic thinking is now becoming um, almost part of the vocabulary. Um, um, and I'm pleased to, to, you know, talk to many dyslexic kids over the years to try to make them realize that, um, you know, you know, do not, do not be worried about it. Um, you know, look at, look at the areas that you, um, that you enjoy and con concentrate on those. Um, and the areas that you're not great at, um, you, uh, you know, either that you'll catch up later on in life, um, or, you know, if you're going to start a business, you can delegate and find other people who can deal with those. Um, so I think dyslexic, di di dyslexic people really excel at the things that things that they that interest them. Um, and I think I, I know a lot of a lot of business people, for instance, who were dyslexics, who've um, who uh, have have, have um, gone gone on to do incredible things. Your headmaster. Um, I, I read the very uh, slightly humorous, slightly um, shocking story of uh, when you were at boarding school. You had a little bit of a romantic run in with his <laughs> his, his daughter Charlotte. Uh, got expelled, uh, staged a fake suicide. Got unexpelled. Um, and then you, as you referenced a second ago, you had this idea for the student magazine. I read that there was a an ultimatum given to you by your headmaster where he said, Richard, I know you're starting this magazine. You, you either got to leave school or um, st and start the magazine or stay in school and focus on your f formal education. And at that point, you made the decision to jump ship. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the headmaster was very foresighted. I think, uh, you know, if a kid at school wants to start a national magazine for young people what a great education and they, they should have they should have welcomed us to stay at school and do it for, you know within the from from school uh but the headmaster wasn't going to um allow me to do that um and and, and thank god because um you know getting out into the real world uh, I'd, I'd achieved a lot more than i would have done um if he if he'd um if, if he if he'd been pleasant and said uh, you know run the magazine from school um, there were a lot. There was a lot going on in the world. Um, you know, there was the Vietnamese War. Um, there was the Biafran War. Um, there were um, uh, the provosts in Holland. There was um, uh, uh, there was the education system that needed students to rebel against, and um, and the, and so it was a, it was an exciting time in the sixties to leave school, go to London, um, and um, try to start a magazine. I watched your, um, as I watched your docu-series yesterday in that, that theatre um, that we're all in, including yourself, one of the lines really struck, with, struck me when, when they showed the, the small room that you were building this magazine in. I know sometimes it was a post box, but sometimes there was a small room, I think at a later date. A, a line was said, which was, um, this was my education. And yeah. for young people who are considering take, taking a leap when they have very little responsibility or think, you know, very little to lose, throwing themselves in that kind of throwing themselves in a situation where they'll fail their way to an education struck me as being so important and so underrated. You don't have kids or you don't have a house or a mortgage. Um, and it seems like that's exactly what you did. You used like failure and risk as a way to self-educate. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult for me to recommend it to everybody listening to this program because um, not everyone's going to be successful. And obviously, you and I have been fortunate that we we have had success doing it that way. Um, some people, and I'm not going to get put my conservative hat on, knowing that the parents may be listening as well. Um, you know, some people will benefit from having an education, you know, degree or whatever to fall back on if they if they if they they find that they they just can't make a go of it in business. Um, but anyway, for I th I think for the two of us, um, I think the, um, uh, yeah, being out in the real world, I mean, I learned so much. Um, and, uh, um, and it, you know, it's held me into such good stead th throughout my life. Um, 
you know, in running a magazine, of course, you know, you're going out interviewing people, you're learning every time you interview somebody. Um, I, uh, I'd, you know, I think um, being, being a journalist or being, a, being an editor, you, uh, it's not so different from being an entrepreneur. You're, you're out all the time meeting di- new people in different sectors, just learning, learning, learning. Um, and, um, and, you know, through the magazine, uh, a lot of people would write with problems. Um, young people would write with problems. So um, we ended up setting up a, a, a student advisory centre uh, where we would um, uh, give people advice on venereal disease or gay, gay pe- the gay population or um, or um, you know contraceptive advice, abortion advice, um, psychiatric advice. Um, you know and. And, and, you know, just meeting all these people with all these different problems, suicidal, uh, um, uh, su- su- suicidal mental problems, um, really opened, opened my mind. It was just a fascinating, fascinating education. And, um, and throughout my life since then, I've spent a lot of my life trying to uh, address some of these issues in a, in a, in a, first of all, in a wider sense in London and now more, more on a global scale. And, um, but, but that was, you know, that edu- education of, um, w- was so important. Um, you know, for instance, I remember when I was 15 in London, you know, somebody who was gay came to me saying that they wanted help. And, um, maybe I, was, I just turned 16 and, um, and I thought very naively that when they said they wanted help, that, that you know they didn't want to be gay. Um, of course, you know, within a month or two, I realised that you know that people are born gay, and uh, and uh, and they don't have a choice in the matter. And um, and what they what they desperately need needed in those days was to meet other gay people, and because uh, because you know if they came from. Um, some remote place in the UK where gay people weren't accepted. Um, they would come to London desperately seeking, uh, seeking love or see- seeking friendship. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so, you know, ba- just little things like that um, I learned from um, just, just being out there uh, listening and doing. Your, that, was, that magazine was your, um, the first sort of big notable thing that you'd, you'd done in business. And throughout your story, and even before I'd, I'd met you and watched the docu-series and read the book, I was told by other people, Richard Branson's a sup- an amazing delegator. You mentioned it earlier on, your, your, your delegation skills. To understand how to delegate to someone else, you first, as you've said, need to understand your strengths and weaknesses and also their strengths and weaknesses. So what is what are your strengths in your own words? What is the bit of the puzzle that you're good at? I think I'm good with people. Um, I think... Um uh, I trust. I, I can trust people. I think I can surround myself with, um, uh, you know, with 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 really really good people. I think I'm uh, able to, um, uh, yeah, to delegate to de- to delegate, not to second second guess them all the time. Um, uh, yeah, to praise, not criticize, um, and um, uh, and. Uh, I, I think I'm. I think I'm quite good at uh, if I create something, making sure it's the best, you know, the best in its area, um, so that the people who are working for Virgin are really proud of what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, it's really important that um, you know if, if 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 somebody's in a pub and they work for Virgin and somebody says, "What do you do?" that they're uh, they're proud of the fact that, that that you know they work for Virgin and they're happy to say it. Um, and there are some companies that that, that um, if people work for, they won't they won't really want to be able to say that they work for such and such a company. Um, yeah, so I think I I, I think I think the people skills um, is 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 the, is the most important um, skill. Um, I think. Um, uh, just giving, giving, you know, g- giving things a try. Um, uh, you know, screw it, let's do it. Obviously, it's one a phrase I made did years ago, and and uh, and I've used that phrase many many a time. You know, somebody comes with a an idea, and I like them, and um, and um, yeah, just say 
um, you know, let, let's let's give it a go. And um, and sometimes we both we we all flat fall flat on our face. Sometimes some, sometimes it succeeds. And conversely, then, what are the what are the weaknesses that you've kind of observed in yourself, or the things that you tend to delegate to other people? Um, I, I actually read something which said, which is a quote of yours. It said, "I wanted an IQ, an IQ test at eight years old. I don't think I filled in anything." Going forward 30 or so years, I was running Europe's largest private group of companies, but I didn't know the difference between gross and net profit, but it didn't matter. Yes, I was in a board meeting uh, when I was about 50 years old and um, uh, and the director um, said, um, and I think I said, is that good news or bad news? And, the, and one of the directors said, come, come outside, Richard, a minute. So came outside and he said, you don't know the difference between net and gross, do you? So I said, uh, no. Um, uh, he said, I thought not. Anyway, I brought a sheet of paper. So he brings out this sheet of paper and he uh, he, he has some co colour pens and he, he colours it in blue and then he puts a fishing net in, the, um, in it and then he puts a little fish in the fishing net and he says... Um, so the fish that are in the net, that's your profit at the end of the year. And the rest of the ocean, that's your gross turnover. And um, I went, I got it. And uh, <laughs> I was ever, ever since then, I've been name dropping net and gross to people who've obviously know full, full well what it is. For, <laughs> and and um, but, the, but the point of the story is uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it's, it's a good idea, most likely, if you're, your chief, your chief accountant uh, knows, um, uh, but you know, for a, for somebody who's running a company, what matters is can you, um, you know, can you create the best um, the best company in its sector? You know, if you're going to create an airline, is it going to be palpably better than um, the rival airline? If you create a cruise company, is it going to be palpably better than? the other cruise companies, if you're going to create a train company, is it going to be palpably better than what's gone before? And if it is, then at the end of the year, it's likely that more money that will come in than goes out. Um, and um, uh, and then somebody, you know, somebody else can add up, add up the figures. Um, uh, so I think, you know, to, to be, to, to run a, to run a business, you know, yes, it helps to add up, it helps to subtract, it helps to multiply. Um, I don't even think you need to worry about division. Um, that that's it. So um, uh, uh, you know, so if you can if you can do those three things, um, uh, you, you can run a business. If you can't do those three things, I wouldn't worry too much. You find somebody else you can, and just but just go out and create something that's going to make a positive difference to other people's lives. That student magazine became um, kind of pivoted at the end into a, a mail order music business, which is a big part of the, the docu-series that we watched yesterday. Um, but then it became so many more things. And it's the, the, the interesting thing is kind of how you swang from one of these business ideas to the next, because you'd seen a product or service that you thought could be done better, or there was an opportunity there. When I, you know, in, in the school of entrepreneurship, if that's like a metaphorical thing, we always talk about the importance of focus. Now, when I look at your story from 15 years old, starting that magazine to starting a mail order business around, I think, 20, uh, 22 years old when Virgin was kind of um, conceptualized and launched. And then by the age of 33, you've got 50 different companies involving everything from filmmaking to um, conditioner cleaning and, and generating more than $10 million in sales. I go, this is not what they told me about the need <laughs> for focus in the school of business. They said focus. You kind of break that law, it seems, of focus. So... Um uh, so I've I've never really thought of myself as a business person. Um, uh, obviously, you know, on paper I am an entrepreneur um, or a business person. Um, uh, I've never really be, been interested in the bottom line, despite uh, what the uh, the, the doc, docu series seems to betray. Um, uh, I've I've really have been interested in creating things I can be proud of, um, and. Uh, and a lot of those things come out of personal frustration, and I must have been frustrated quite a lot when I was young because <laughs> I've and, and, and ended up, you know, trying a lot of things, um, uh, and um, and I just found it great fun um, investing in 
you know, people I met, um, you know, it, uh, you know, somebody will come along and, uh, you know, the, the, the music business may have been, um, you know, struggling at one stage in my career with, with, with the advent of the iPod and, um, so, you know, a couple of guys come along and say, um, you know, we, we, you, you should do mobile phones. This is, you know, this would replace the music business and, um, and they were great, great, great people. And, and, um, you know, so we thought, screw it, you know, let's do it. Let's you know, go into the mobile phone business. And, and, and so if we, if we'd stayed still and only done, only focused on one business, um, uh, maybe let's say the record business, um, uh, let's say record stores, um, which is one of our earlier, earlier things. Um, uh, we most likely wouldn't have a business today because the re re you know mega stores and, and and record stores no longer exist because um, uh, the 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 iPod and free music really put them out of business. Um, um, so you know so by actually going against the rule rules of you know what you learn in business school, um, we you know we we're still going strong you know fifty five years later. Um, and um, uh, and diversification actually saved us. I mean, like you know, during COVID, uh, uh, you know, Virgin Atlantic and our very badly hit uh, uh, companies uh, was was saved by Virgin. I uh, mean, being able to sell sell Virgin Galactic shares. So um, so diversification um, is far more exciting. <laughs> um, you you learn a hell of a lot more and. Um, it can be useful in times of crisis. It's clear that only a great delegator would, would be able to diversify without creating, um, spreading themselves too thinly per se. And For I, sure. I guess that goes back to that skill of diversif um, of delegation. Mm. Your headmaster said something to you that my best friend Joe Ridgway said to me when I was 18 years old after I dropped out of university. My best friend Joe Ridgway um, from Plymouth said to me, I remember I was stood in this this curry shop on, uh, mm. on in Rushholm. He said, you're either going to be a millionaire or in prison. Now, when I read that this morning, when I was doing research on um, mm. your headmaster, it stopped me and my, and my breakfast halfway through my sort of chew. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, gosh. Yeah. Now, I know why he said that to me, because he knew there was a certain level of desperation in me and there was a certain craftiness, which was, could either take me, <laughs> could yeah. either be used for good or evil. When you was, when you did the student magazine, that, that um, prophecy appeared to come true one day when the police raided your um, magazine and arrested you. And I learned about this in the doc docu-series last night. Your, your mother then puts her house on the line to get you out of jail and you choose to expand, you, you choose to expand your way out of the problem, which for you men, as it said in the docu-series, opening 30 record stores that year to be able to pay your mother back. Have you always chosen to expand your way out of problems? Um... Yes, I think I think the answer is yes. Um, I mean, I <clears throat> I spent one night in prison. I, um, in those days, you had to pay tax on um, records if you shipped them to Europe. Sadly, with Brexit, you're going to have people going to have to do that again. But um, uh, and um, uh, and I stumbled into the fact that if you <laughs> drove across the channel and drove back again you had a piece of paper which said you'd exported the records and therefore you, you didn't have to pay the tax and um and um uh but uh anyway so we 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 we, we got a, a a bad rap on the knuckles i spent I spent a night in prison and swore never ever ever uh um, to spend a second night in prison in my life um and uh and yes we expanded fast in order to pay pay off the fine um uh, we just needed the turnover, um, and it was it was actually um, uh, a, a, actually a really um, uh, a, a, a wonderful booster to to all the team at Virgin <laughs> to to um, uh, and um, uh, and fortunately you know we managed within three years to pay to pay it off. Um, but um, I mean, I it, it, sometimes we're expanding. Uh, uh, expanding just for the sheer pleasure of learning about something new, and um, uh, and then maybe occasionally on like like on that occasion we're expanding to get ourselves out of problem out of trouble. 
quick one. This episode is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz, who recently got in touch to support the driver CEO. I'm becoming quite the fan of electric cars, and of course, a huge fan of Mercedes-Benz. I have one of my own. The Mercedes-Benz luxury electric range, known as Mercedes EQ, is at the very forefront of this industry, which is what really stood out to me. If you're looking for a business car, the sustainability credentials, economic benefits, general convenience, and high levels of luxury, which everybody knows Mercedes-Benz for, in their all-electric cars are truly groundbreaking. In terms of features, their next-generation technology across the range is second to none. For example, there's intuitive MBUX technology with AI that learns your behavior and keeps you connected to the things that matter to you. Not to mention, all Mercedes EQ cars offer exemption from the ultra-low emission zone charge and London congestion charge. So if, like me, you're really excited about all things electric cars and if you haven't checked out the Mercedes EQ range then search Mercedes-Benz fleet to see how they can take your business to the next level. Quick word from one of our sponsors, you must be living under a rock if you've not heard about WeWork. But I think in the modern world where people are working remotely, on the go, they're entrepreneurs building their businesses, WeWork has never been more important than it is right now. There are some incredible things WeWork have released to enable entrepreneurs like you, like me, to be able to work flexibly, comfortably with the resources, Wi-Fi and everything else, the infrastructure we need in hundreds of locations around the world. And one of those things is called WeWork All Access. Well, if you have all access WeWork, you can work in hundreds of different locations as you travel around the world and as you move around the world and as you go to meetings around the world. WeWork for entrepreneurs, in my opinion, is a total game changer. And to encourage you to check WeWork out, if you've never worked in one before, I'm offering 50% off a one-day booking if you go to we.co slash CEO and use the promo code DIARY. Check it out. I love WeWork and they've been great partners and supporters of this podcast. The most, from my perspective, one of the most um, terrifying decisions you ever made was to go into the airline industry. Warren Buffett's fairly famous for saying that he has once considered employing someone to sit in his office and every time he feels like investing in an airline to talk him out of it because it's such a absurd, terrifying business to get into. You were running a very successful record label and record store um, business by then. You had many, many companies, many investments, and you decided to take this huge bet to start an airline. Now, there's a lot said about why. Could you tell me in your own words why? Um, it, it it really was out of frustration of um, flying on other people's airlines, having, having bad experiences, um, and feeling that um, we could... Uh, we could do it better. We could make it. It could be more fun. I mean, in 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 those days, uh, you know, if you flew on, say, British Airways, it was a monopoly. Um, uh, they, you know, you were you you maybe got a lump of chicken dumped in your lap. Um, there was no entertainment. Um, the cabin crew certainly didn't enjoy working for the company, and um, and you really felt like you were just being herded from A to B in in a, in a cattle truck. Um, and um, uh, and so uh, I flew. I was flying all over the world um, to um, uh, to uh, to visit our record companies because we had record companies in most countries around the world, and and just felt you know that, that we we could we could do it better. Um, uh, somebody came along to us with the idea of a business airline um, only. I didn't think that would be very exciting to run. Um, and um, uh, but I thought a, a really really good quality airline for everybody, including business people, um, you know, would be a, 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 a something special to run. And um, uh, and so ended up ring, ringing up Boeing and um, and having a wonderful discussion with a, a wonderful guy called R. J. Wilson, and um, ending up um, being able to uh, lease a secondhand seven four seven from him. Um, and, um, and because, you know, uh, uh, I do like to, you know, to protect the downside, which is obviously important in business. Um, I d did a deal with him whereby I could hand the plane back at the end of 12 months if, you know, if my instinct was not right. Um, and, um, but fortunately at the end of 12 months, people love flying on Virgin Atlantic and we ended up you know, getting a second and a third plane from Boeing, and um, and that was yeah, thirty eight years ago, and um, and you know, Virgin Atlantic has um, 
uh, you know, it's, it's like a uh, it's like roughly the same age as my daughter. Um, uh, you know, she, um, she's been uh, the, the airline's been bullied um, by British Airways. I mean, famously through the Dirty Tricks campaign. Um, uh, it was a really tough time. Um, we took BA to court and we won the biggest libel damages in history. Um, uh, um, she's had she's had to go through the like think crashes like the um, uh, nine 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 eleven disaster, um, the two thousand eight disaster, um, there's the COVID disaster, um, and uh, and I'm sure that we've. It, you know that, that it's cost us more money than um, than we've ever made from it, um, uh, but it's been the flagship, of, you know, for Virgin. Um, it's enabled us to launch other companies in different countries around the world on the back of the the strong brand and the strong reputation it's had. Um, and uh, she's she's a a daughter that I will zealously protect and and um, uh, as long as I can. When you look back at why that business survived, considering the fierce competition, considering what British Airways did and were ultimately found guilty of in court with their Dirty Tricks campaigns, the bit that really st stuck out to me yesterday was hearing that they had a staff member hack into your customer database um, to, to kind of see, spy on what you were doing. That went to court. You won the battle. Um, and that acted as a, a real boost, I think, for Virgin because it kind of staged you as this sort of David versus Goliath um, situation where you were the underdog. But as you look back on that journey, um, many people have fallen in that industry. It's a graveyard, as you say in the documentary. Why did Virgin win? What was it? Was it brand? Was it customer experience? Was it just grit? I, th I think that... Um, uh, I think a lot comes back to staff. I mean, um, the, the, we, we, we've ha always had a great um, team of people working at Virgin. They're they're really proud of the company. Um, uh, um, they um, uh, we've done things. You know, we've always been ahead of ahead of the pack in in um, new innovations. So, um, you know, seat back videos, for instance, we were the first airline to introduce seat back videos in the world. Um, uh, the um, uh, you know sleeper seats for business class passengers. Um, uh, um, you know, stand up bars and, um, and, and lounges and so on. Um, you know, collect, collecting money at the door, you know, um, for charity that, um, Virgin was the first to do that. And now pretty well every airline and most airports are doing it as well, this change. Um, so I think, um, uh, you know, every, every little detail, I think we, we um, the team have got right at, at Virgin. Um, and, um, uh, and if you get the little details right, uh, the, you know, um, then collectively, um, uh, you, it makes for an exceptional company over an average company. And um, you know, if I'm on a Virgin plane, I'll, I'll, or in any Virgin company, I'll have my notebook. I'll take notes. I'll listen to listen to the staff, listen to the customers, um, you know, um, and then act on it when I get to the far end. And um, uh, and and then be in touch, back in touch with the people who you know gave me the ideas to thank them and tell them what we've done, and 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 I think a good a good leader has to be a good listener, um, and if you're if you're um, uh, uh, and that's I think one of the most important attributes of a good leader. I grabbed my phone halfway through watching the docu series yesterday when you mentioned the seat back videos because in the same breath you mentioned how every accountant would tell you. Um, not to do many of the things that you've chosen to do, but also the banks wouldn't even lend you the money to, to do the seatback videos. They'd give you the money, to, like $2 billion to do the planes, but they wouldn't give you the 10 million to do the seatback videos. You've mentioned instinct as well a few times. As a CEO over the years, I've had this battle between like instinct and the CFO. You seem to tend to, I think the quote you said was, um, you tend not to consult finance people and accounts people when you, when you have these ideas. How have you found that battle between the two? between your instinct and your vision and the money people going, this won't work, this doesn't make sense? I suspect that you're, an on, you're the entrepreneur and, and they're the CFO because you're the entrepreneur and they're the CFO. So I think you just got to believe in your, 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 your instinct and, um, and um, 
uh, and and go with it. And if you create something, you know, I mean, we're just opening a new hotel in uh, New York. Um, you know, if it's the best hotel in New York, even if it's gone over budget in, in the building of it, which it which it will have done, um, uh, the the best always succeeds. Um, uh, you know, we 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 famously during COVID uh, launched a new cruise line, Virgin Voyages. Um, uh, you know, it is you know so much better than any other cruise line out there. Um, you know, we've had two years where we've had to moth mothball the ships, um, but you know we've stuck with it because we know that the the quality is such that. Um, people will seek it out, and and uh, and the feedback's been you know spectacular. I mean, it's Virgin, it, Virgin at its absolute best. Um, I'm actually heading there this afternoon. Um, you know, it's fascinating. Each ship has 78 different nationalities working on it. Um, you know, 1,200 people, um, and they're just the best. And um, and it's adults only, and it's a lot of fun. And um, uh, but the, you know, there were moments during COVID that we did think, you know, we, we definitely chose the wrong <laughs> business to launch. Virgin at its absolute best. What does that mean? What is Virgin at its best? Virgin at its best is when you launch a new company and you know that because, you know, people have experienced previous Virgin companies, um, that they will give it a try. You don't really have to even advertise. Um, they, they, they know that when they went on a Virgin train, uh, when, when we ran the network, that it was you know, really good quality. When they went on a Virgin plane, it was good quality. When they went into Virgin Health Club, it was good quality um, and so on. Um, and um, so you know, that, that gives us a big advantage with, with a brand that, that uh, people have tried, they've loved um, and so when we launch something new like a cruise line, that they will give it a go, and and we make sure that we don't let them down, um, and 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 then, you know, having them try the cruise line, if we decide to do a new venture, um, you know, we can we can we can, it's that much easier for us to launch it off off the back of the cruise line. You you, you are so synonymous with the the Virgin. I don't think I've, I know a person who is as synonymous with their brand as an individual. So when you think of Virgin, you think of Richard Branson, you think of Richard Branson, you think Virgin. Um, and in 1985, you start doing some pretty extreme adventures around the world, which become kind of pay into the brand and give give the brand extra meaning. Things like crossing crossing the Atlantic by boat, which sunk. Uh, it seems like a lot of the uh, the trips you took either collapsed, <laughs> like fell out the sky into the into the the sea, or the boat sank. Um, you set so many records th through that period. Um, so, so you know, I was reading about you going 250 miles per hour in a hot air balloon across the the Pacific from Japan to the Arctic in Canada, again, breaking um, existing records at the time. This became a real hallmark of like the the Richard Branson and Virgin brand, these extreme adventures. Was that intentional? When you did that first one, did you, was was it because of a marketing thing or was it because of the fun of doing it for yourself? It started out uh, as a, a mixture of the two, but more, uh, we had one plane um, and Somebody said, you know, why, why don't we try to bring the Blue Ribbon back to Britain for the fastest boat across the Atlantic? Um, and, you know, we can, we can, we can build this boat. Um, and, um, uh, but it ended up being um, much more than just a marketing adventure. It became, it became a real adventure. I mean, it was you know, tremendously exciting. And um, I was in, in my very early thirties and, and, um, uh, and, you know, it was tough, but it was it was great fun. Um, there were, you know, lots of um, moments of drama, uh, which there always are when you're trying something that's never really been tried before. Um, including, as you pointed out, <laughs> we sang we sang before we got the whole way across. Um, uh, but um, uh, but anyway, it makes for a good documentary series, it um, and it makes for a good book, and 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 um, and. You know, and it did put Virgin on the map. It made Virgin a much more sexy brand, um, a more adventurous brand than, say, British Airways, our rival, um, uh, and and other and other and other brands. Um, uh, I mean, 
Virgin Atlantic cheekily took a full page ad when we when we when we sank in the Atlantic. The, the only thing that was sticking out of the Atlantic of the boat was um, the, the brand Virgin, and um, and the ad just had the picture of the boat sticking out of the water, and and the ad said, "Next time, Richard, take the plane." <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of, of course, there, would have, there, there were people who said, you know, what have you seen? What if you end up in the, in the Atlantic? You, you, you know, no one's going to want to fly an, an airline where... Um, but of course, it, it's quite the reverse. It's, it, it, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, it, it, helped put, it helped put a sm tiny little airline on the map um, uh, more, more effectively than anything else we could do and much more cheaply. You mentioned that ad from, um, from your competitor there. In the moment, competition is the arch enemy, you know, causing you a ton of nuisance. But as you look back on the competition you've had throughout the different industries you've been in, has the competition actually made you stronger and better at what you've done? Yes, and I think the reverse is also true, um, that, that uh, you know, the, these big public companies or big pr um, government-run companies like British Airways have been made the better um, by having um, Virgin Atlantic innovating and you know them having to you know catch us up uh, in, uh, over the years and I think British Airways is a better company today than it was um, you know uh, 38 years ago when we started so competition is good for all of us um, big big and small and um, and the only role that governments need to play is intervening when there's unfair competition um, and that's one of the the most important roles a government can play um, is um, uh, uh, is making sure that they set laws that encourage competition and don't stifle competition. Um, and um, uh, and you know we've had uh, yeah anyway there, there have been books written about um, uh, about companies that have tried to st stifle Virgin in the past, but. Um, somehow we somehow we came through. There's this term now called personal branding, which has become very popular predominantly because of social media and everybody having a channel and they can build followers and they can try and tell the world who their company is using social media. But you were kind of the first CEO personal brand to many people because um, everything you did added value to the brand. And it wasn't just what Virgin said. I think when I look at your story, it teaches me that the brand is what what the people do and what the founder does becomes the brand more so than ever. Um, and I think that's often what we lose sight of. And some of the best band brands in the world, like the Red Bulls of the world, have figured out that the things you do say much more about the brand than what you say. Yeah. And you, you are like the perfect example of that. In the early 90s, you got in a bit of a, a struggle because of the, the broader economy and you ended up selling your record business. From all accounts and from speaking to some of your current team, they said that this was a very difficult moment for you, that it was crushing, I think the quote that I, that I was told. Um, is that accurate and why was it, why was it crushing? Oh, look, I think uh, um, if, if you think of your, if you think of the, um, uh, the things that you create like children, <laughs> which, um, uh, which I, I do, and, and, and I'd think of it like that because it is just a bunch of people. Um, and um, I mean, you know, you, your business is yourself and a, and a, gr a group of people. Um, if you sell it, it's like selling, selling, you know, if you sell a company, it's like selling a group of children. And, and that's, um, uh, that's tough all round. Um, I needed to, uh, I needed a war chest um, to combat British Airways and, 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 the, and the dirty tricks that they were um, uh, they they'd launched at Virgin and um, and you know so you know the, the war chest um, that I, that I thought I could best tap into was Virgin Records. Um, the good thing was that you know the, the staff at Virgin Records you know still had a had a job but um, working for another company and the staff at Virgin Atlantic were safe because we had the, the financial clout to um, to deal to deal with our competitor. Um, so there are, there, you know, there are obviously times in life where you have to make tough decisions like that, and um, uh, and uh, and yeah, but it and, and move and move on. 
you have any regrets about about how that happened about that phase um i have I, I always think that if, if anybody asked me if I ever have any regrets about anything, it, it would be I'd be a very sad person to answer answer positively because, you know, I've, I've had the most extraordinary life. Um, it's been full of, you know, interesting twists and turns. Um, uh, and I honestly really you know, can't think of anything I regret you know, in the past. Um, the... Um, and I think I, I really do think I'd be a sad person if I if I had regrets. I mean, I've just, it's just been um, rich with rich with um, uh, you know adventure and uh, and um, and people and and um, and, and I, I'm not somebody who looks back uh, by and large. I mean, obviously, an interview like this <laughs> I will, but um, uh, and I suppose I've reached an age where. You know, it's important to write books and it's important to do documentaries and. You know, um, because it's important not to waste your life, and 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 it's important to share what you've learned. How did you feel yesterday watching the um, docu series on your life? I, I was sat just behind you, so I'd watch, I'd look at the screen, and then I'd look at your reaction, <laughs> and I'd see you laughing sometimes. And um, I was emotionally drained, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I, after the after party, um, I just could not really get my my words out for the first half an hour. Um, uh, it, you know, I found it quite, you know, fairly exhausting. Um, I mean, they've, it, it's incredible, uh, a really good documentary maker and, the, and Chris Smith is one of the best in the world. I mean, you know, prides himself on, on his independence, which I respect completely. And, and so we, you know, we didn't have input into it. Um, you know, obviously therefore not everything one's going to agree with and, and not everything is, you know, in, in my brain would, be exactly as as it was, but nine, you know, ninety five percent, ninety six percent was 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 as I see it. And but 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 just what is is incredible was the archive footage they managed to find. Um, you know, considering we'd had my, my main house burnt down, um, my, my main house blown down in a hurricane um, twice. Um, uh, the fact that anything survived to be able to make such a uh, you know such a really full quite you know really quite exciting i think um docu you know, documentary series was um uh, you know i have to take my hat off to them and then in the uh as i watched the, the last episode of the docu series last night i saw you once again in typical richard branson style set yourself a new frontier which was space as if you you know as if all of that you'd done before wasn't enough you you decided to aim for the stars why? <laughs> um, so I remember um, many, many, many years ago um, when President Gorbachev was um, uh, leader of Russia and he was trying to bring Perestroika, um, Perestroika uh, to um, uh, the West and trying to um, put out peace signs. Um, he invited me to come to Russia to be the first person to go up in a Russian um, spaceship, um, but it would have meant uh, a big check, um, you know, 60 million. It would have meant um, a year um, learning Russian and being in Russia. And I just didn't have the time that, uh, and already the, the spare money to do something like that. But it, it did just get me thinking, um, you know that's an inordinate amount of money to charge for somebody to go to space. You know, for that kind of money, we, 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 why why couldn't I just build start building a spaceship? Um, and um, and so we registered Virgin Galactic Airways, and um, and I was set up, went around the world trying to see if we could find somebody to build us a spaceship, and um, and then just found this genius Bert Rutan. You know, to me. Um, you know, I've 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 you know, always dreamt of going to space one day. Um, I think uh, fifty percent of the people listening to this program will 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 have will have dreamt or will dream of going to space. Fifty percent will think, we, you know, why why on earth would you want to do that? Um, but um, you know, it's it, it was the most extraordinary day of my life. Um, the, the, my my trip to space um, uh, and uh, and 
you know, looking back at this beautiful, beautiful earth that we live on, it was um, uh, from space whilst <laughs> whilst floating, uh, um, at the you know, whilst floating with a lovely group of people. Um, uh, just an extraordinary um, experience, and um, uh, and to be honest, to, yeah, to pinch 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 oneself moment to be doing it in a spaceship that we that we built, and uh, um, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, so it it was a dream come true. In that documentary, we're also reminded of the the cost of all of these endeavors. At a moment when there's a shot of you taking a phone call at your house, learning that in the lead up to um, Virgin Galactics going to space for the first time, an astronaut had died in one of the tests. It's a very emotional scene, but it, it is a reminder of, of um, the cost of these great endeavors to humanity. That day when you received that phone call and then you, you rushed yourself to the, to, the, to the site, what's on your mind? So it's happened to me twice in my life. Um, uh, you know, I was once in a cinema in um, uh, in Europe uh, with my kids, and I my phone just kept uh, kept vibrating, and 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 I ignored it and ignored it, and then on the sort of third or fourth time, I, I decided to walk out of the cinema and check it, um, and one of our trains had come off. Um, the track and um, uh, and you know straight away I knew that you know um, I just had to get to the scene of the accident um, and you know there were no flights that night so we had to had to drive through the through the night um, and then yeah and um, uh, and then anyway we got got there um, at, at early early in the morning the next day one a uh, lady had died and uh, you know and i um went went to the morgue to meet the relatives and um you know we we had a hug hug and um uh and um i mean fortunately it turned out it wasn't actually a virgin's fault but um you know but we are still obviously responsible for um the fact that it was on a virgin train um and um and uh and then you've got to, as, as owner, um, you know, confront, talk to the press, and and um, and, but it, 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 I think the fact that you make the fact that you make an effort and get get there quickly uh, is very important. And and the same when when when, when we uh, lost a test spaceship, um, uh, I knew straight away based on my previous experience with the train that I'd, I needed to be there as fast as possible. Is there a conversation about discontinuing Virgin Galactic at that moment after losing that life? Yeah, there was. I mean, uh, you know, we I sat down with George Whiteside and just said, you know, is it, you know, asked ourselves questions, is it worth it? Is it worth, um, you know, is it worth continuing? What, 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 what would happen if we had a second accident? Um, uh, you know, we would never 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 be forgiven i mean it would you know it would um our reputations would be destroyed um um uh um but then we then we spoke with all the all the engineers and um we spoke with many of the people who signed up to go to space and and we spoke with the family and um of, of um uh of the pilot who'd, who'd lost and with one with one voice they said you know, you just got to, you've got to continue. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and we did, and, and, uh, we're still, you know, we're still, <coughs> um, you know, we're still at the early stage of space travel. There's still risks. I mean, it's, it, uh, we're, we think that, um, you know, we don't, um, you know, we think that we're through all the big risks. Um, uh, you know, we've, we've got a, we can automatically switch off a, um, uh, an engine, if uh, you know, if, if anything wrong, goes wrong with the rocket motor, just and 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 we've got we've got astronauts actually flying, flying our craft. Um, but it is the it is it is the early stages, and um, but um, but I think everybody everybody involved are doing it with their eyes open. One of the most um, beautiful, heart wrenching scenes from the docu series is in two thousand and twenty one, when you are months away from 
your first space flight on your on your own spaceship, spacecraft, space plane, whatever, <laughs> they, whatever the terminology is. Um, you've named it after your mother. You've named the mothership after Eve. And then tragically, um, she passes away from COVID before she has the chance to embark on that space journey with you, which she was planning to do. That phase of your life when you lose your mother, when you lose Eve, what impact does that have on you and your mission? Um, it, it, I mean, first of all, she'd lived a, a, uh, a long life and, and an extraordinary life. And, and so it was, um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I was very, very fortunate and our family were very fortunate to have had her around so long. Um, and, um, uh, and the absolute last thing that she would have wanted was for, for, um, for the mission or any missions to be held up, um, as a result of her death. I mean, you know, she, she will, uh, you know, if there's a star up there, um, she'll be on it and, and, and I'm sure that she was there and, uh, there in spirit when, um, when, when, when I went to space and she definitely would have been smiling, smiling down, down, down at us with, with my dad Ted, um, and um, uh, so uh, yeah, and so I think when, when, when we when we lose loved ones, we, we, it's you know we, we you, you live on you live on through your parents and your and um, your children live on through you and and your grandchildren live on through your your children and uh, and you know that's the sort of wonder the wonders of life. And when you came down from that space flight. Um, which is detailed in your your second memoir, in the, the sort of updated version, which has just been updated. You wrote a letter to your mum after coming down from space. You said, Dear mum, you always told me to reach for the stars while I took my own winding road, but I always knew when to follow your lead. You always pushed us to our limits. You were always a dreamer. You urged me to strive for every opportunity I saw. You told me to chase my wildest fantasies, to live life to the full, how you lived, how you loved, and how you are missed. Yeah, I mean, she, um, you know, I think, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, when, when people read the book, they'll think about their own, their own mums and dads and, and, um, and, you know, how, how, how lucky, lucky we are to have mums and dads who sacrifice so much for us. And, um, in, as, as we, as we, as we grow up and then obviously later on in life, um, one can, you can, one can give, you know, give give back and in, in um, looking after them as they get a little bit older. The docu series was a bit of a punch in the face from the start because that because of that opening scene about your family, where you're sat there ahead of your journey to space, trying to say some words to Holly, Sam, and Joan, your wonderful wife and your kids, just in case you never make it back from space. This is something that you've done time and time again before you embarked on these journeys. Um, Really, really difficult to watch. Really difficult to watch. Um, and took me by, by surprise because it was so early on in the film. Why, why, was, why is it so hard to, to get those words out? Otherwise, you seem like such a composed individual. But when it came to those words, it seemed like, you, you know, multiple mm -hmm. takes. You got up, you walked away, you came back, got up, walked away and came back. So, um, so first of all, I, I do... Uh, um, I cry in happy films. I cry in sad films. My kids bring a box of tissues when we when we go to the cinema or used to, um, and uh, so that, <laughs> that, 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 that I'm, I, I, so I am, um, uh, you know, even even now just talking to you, I can feel tears in my eyes. So um, so um, uh, so it, it's, it's not surprising for me to suddenly uh, not not be able to get my get through my sentence sometimes. Um, but obviously, look if you if you're uh, if you're reading um, if you're if you're if you're speaking about as if you as if you've died to um, you know to to your kids and your grandkids um, yeah lots of emotions go through your head at the time of saying of speaking I, I suspect even the emotions of my God should I be <laughs> should you know is is it, is it worth it and a lot a lot of the, the this documentary series is asking the question is it selfish is it worth it is it uh is it is it is it is it something um 
Uh, is it is it something that um, one should be doing? Um, I remember um, I was in I was just taking off on um, to go across the Pacific in a hot air balloon and walking into this truck and um, Joan Thurkettle from ITN was just finishing editing my obituary um, in case I didn't come back and she said you know Richard do you, do you want to sit and watch the obituary um, and I said well, why, why not and um, and you know I sat and watched the obituary and again had a couple of tears in my eyes at the end of it but um, but um, you know but I do think that in life well, you know one advantage of doing these adventures is actually you do confront the ultimate inevitability of, of um, you know that you're not going to be here forever and so you do think about uh, you know have I left everything in order um you know what am i going to say to my children what am i going to say to my grandchildren and a lot of people don't have that opportunity because they, they they die suddenly so um you know it's, so i have written quite a few letters over the years uh in thinking that i just may not come back from this adventure or that adventure the documentary also shone a light on joan who has clearly been this huge rock in your life over the years she's a strong tenacious um honest very, uh, very to the point, wonderful woman. What does she mean to you? And what has she meant to you over the last 40, 50 years? Oof. Um, well, I was lucky enough to meet her 45 years ago in a recording studio um, uh, called The Manor. Uh, walked into the kitchen and just looked across the room and she was the most a uh, gorgeous creature I'd never seen in my life. And it was in, instantaneous love from me to her. But, and and it, it was, took me a while the other way around. But she's just a, a fantastic down-to-earth Glaswegian, um, doesn't suffer fools gladly, um, complete opposite to me. Um, you know, doesn't play tennis, doesn't uh, run, doesn't uh, ski, doesn't climb mountains. Um, you know, doesn't go adventuring, but, you know, she's <clears throat> the most fantastic mother for Holly and Sam and the grandkids. Um, and, um, uh, and she knows what matters in life. You know, um, she, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, in, in the end, I suppose what matters is, you know, the love you can give to your children, um, uh, the food on the table. Um, uh, um, yeah, but all uh, above everything, just unreserved love um, to to all, everybody around her, and 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 and, um, uh, and everything else is um, uh, is sort of icing on the cake. You're a man synonymous with living a life worth living. One of the quotes from the film was about you know not living a life um, that is full of risk is not living at all. Words to that effect. If I was Sam or Holly, your kids, and I asked you, I said, Dad, what's, um, what is a, a life worth living? What, what would you say to me? I think just to, for, to first of all, fulfill their own, fulfill their own dreams. I mean, I mean not, not to have their father or mother push them into things they don't want to do. So, um, you know, I was lucky when my, my, my daughter wanted to be a doctor and she, you know, she, she did the medic, she became a doctor. Um, she now helps us with our foundation. Um, my son um, wanted to make films, and and um, uh, and he's a musician basically, which is his main love, and he and he he does a little bit of both of those things. Um, they're both fantastic parents, and they find the time uh, for the grandkids. Um, so I think just to um, you know to to follow to follow whatever dream it is that you have as best you can. Um, and um, uh, and yeah, and uh, you know we've been lucky that our, our kids have our kids have um, I think found their found their path in life. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the last last guest asks a question for the next guest, not knowing who they are asking it for. Um, the question that has been left for you <laughs> is: Where were you? When you when you felt most vulnerable, and why? I think I felt most vulnerable 
um, relatively recently, um, during the uh, about six weeks into COVID, um, when uh, everything everything that we'd built up uh, looked like it was crashing down, um, uh, and uh, and interestingly, when uh, the sort of British press, rather than being supportive, really really turned on us, um, uh, and uh, and but fortunately, you know, my my kids and grandkids, everybody arrived um, on, um, at, at around about that same time, and uh, and the team just got down and worked really hard day and night to make sure we kept as many jobs um, safe as as possible, and. Um, uh, and uh, and I think pretty well every Virgin uh, company got through it, and pretty well every every employee's jobs got protected. Um, but but that was a, that was maybe the toughest time in, um, toughest time in my life. For you know, sudden, suddenly it just looked like one for it. Your, your reputation and everything else was going out of the window. It was, it, um, but COVID was tough for so many people, and um, um, but um, yeah, but. But um, we've we felt it too. Holly and several members of your team referenced that as being um, your toughest moment. But the word tough is just a word. If I zoomed in and I, if I was there, what would I have, and I was you, what would I have seen and what would I have felt when you say the word tough? You, well, I think I, I, I think that um, I, I've never understood uh, depression. Um, uh, and I and, and I think I understood a slight, you know, where where people get depression from after that exper experience. Um, and it was good, you know, it's good to under, you know, it's good to have gone through it myself a bit. I mean, I didn't last too long because um, uh, I've you know br br brought up by you know parents who you know been through the Second World War and you couldn't waste your time you know getting depressed. You know, there were much far worse things than being depressed. Um, but anyway, it, it it taught it taught me to understand it, which I think will hopefully make me better understand other people's depression in the years to come. What were the symptoms of that? Ah, uh, it. What were the symptoms of it? It's very difficult to to pinpoint the symptoms. But you know, look, you just you just feel very sorry for yourself for a, a day or two, and then you just have to snap out of it and 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 get you know. My mum, my mum would have. If she'd been alive, um, well, well, she was. But I mean, if I talked to her about it, she would have told me to pull myself together and just and 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 um, get back to work. And uh, and um, and I think within two or three days, you know, her, her her words would have been ringing in my head, and and I would have um, o overcome it. And I did overcome it. But it just you know, you just a little a taste of it anyway. Richard, so Richard Branson, thank you so much for your time. Um, I. You, to me, you've. When I started this podcast, you were the name. You were the name that, if one day I could speak to on this podcast, I think we might as well pack it up and finish. Because to me, as an entrepreneur my whole life, you've always been the north star of entrepreneurs, and you've represented and embodied what it is to be an entrepreneur that's striving forward to create better mm. in everything you do. I had the pleasure of researching your story again now at 30 years old and it's been a tremendous source of inspiration for me um to meet you today to get to come and watch your docuseries is one of the highlights of my entire entrepreneurial career and life and definitely this podcast so thank you so much for that because i'm i'm not sure you'll ever really appreciate how much of an impact you have on people like me um so i want to make sure that i while i have you here i have a chance to tell you and to thank you for that because You've definitely changed my life and um, I know I'm not the only person. Um, so thank you. Your book is amazing. The docu-series was so captivating. I stayed up till about 3 a.m. last night, making sure I watched all of it and then watched it again, uh, the last mm. episode again this morning. And I implore everybody to go and check it out uh, now on HBO. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is I just wanted to say thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you back and, and um, yeah, many, many congratulations on all, all you've achieved and all, all um, you being a young bastard. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all, all you will achieve in the years to come. Thank you, Richard. Quick one from our longest standing sponsor, Hure. I, I can't tell you over the last, I'd say over the last, really it's been about two and a half years. It was really 
um, post pandemic, how much my health has become such a huge priority in my life. And I have this laser, laser focused on what I'm putting into my body. It's funny because as you get older, you can start to feel the things you're putting into your body more and more and more. Um, and if I, if I put something into my body, especially things like gluten, if I put those things in my body, I feel them tr tremendously the next day, my energy levels, my sleep and everything in between. Huel has been probably the most imp important partner in my health journey because I've been in the boardrooms, I've been to their offices tens and tens and tens and tens of times. I've seen how they make their decisions on nutrition and I trust it. Most of my team that are in this room with me consume it and get the benefits of it too. So if you haven't already tried Huel, do so. Intel are now one of our sponsors on this podcast and I'm here to tell you about their vPro platform. Security and data protection are totally non-negotiable when it comes to the technology I use for my businesses. I'm constantly thinking about where we can upgrade our systems to protect against potential threats. So this is where Intel vPro has become our go-to. Intel vPro is built for businesses. It has a hardware-based multi-layer platform security features protecting from cyber attacks, threat detection, and also recovery systems all in one platform. In an ever-challenging cyber landscape, if I can put measures in place that I believe will save me time and money, then I absolutely will. So head over to intel.co.uk slash vpro to find out how it could work for your business. Uh -huh.